I want you guys to know I'm pretty honored to be here. We, uh, our story is really a story of an accident in a lot of ways, and, and I think that you know, we're not, uh, we were sort of never geared or trained to be experts in this area, but we fell into something that we couldn't ignore and have sort of begun the process of becoming experts in it. And so I think there's a lot to be gained from the sharing of stories. So if it's all right with you guys, I just want to share ours a little bit, give you guys some insight into why we're fighting and sort of what we're doing, and, and then we can sort of talk a little bit more about what, what can be done. My story really begins with a film called Invisible Children. Have you guys seen Invisible Children? It was sort of this documentary that some friends of mine had made about northern Uganda, and they had sort of brought this documentary to us and shown us these stories of these children who were dying in this war in northern Uganda, and, and it was sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, I was 23, it's like, we got to do something, and, and, you know, it's kind of that reaction that people have when they see something that's so big, it's like, we got to do something, and it's like, well, what something, and I don't know, something something, like, something big, what's what big, like, I don't know, big big, like, something historic, like, what's historic, I don't know, you know, I mean, this whole, like, thing that you, especially when you're young, and it's like, we just have to do something, it doesn't really matter what, we just have to respond, and, and so what was happening in northern Uganda at the time was, um, Kids were being basically abducted out of their homes, and they were sleeping in these community centers, these verandas, like sleeping side by side, to sort of escape being abducted. And so uh, what Invisible Children said was, for one night all across the country, let's do the same thing. Let's leave our homes and sleep side by side and close our eyes in order to open up the worlds. And so it was like, cool, let's do this. We're going to do a protest, right? Sort of this like global protest. And none of us had ever done anything like this before, but we're going to organize. And, and it was the first year that Facebook had sort of begun the process of hitting critical mass, right? It was the very beginning. And, and when we were sort of like beginning this process of not just the tech industry being connected and not just sort of first responders being connected, but kind of the masses being connected. And so we sent the word out. And about four weeks before the protest, we had about 4,000 people signed up nationwide, which is pretty shabby. Um, and then it just sort of hit, right, the way that things can only hit in the internet era. And we saw the numbers go like this. And so there was this moment, the night of the protest, you know, it was me and my six best friends. And have you guys ever seen Newsies? Uh, Newsies is like my favorite Disney musical. And, and, and we're sort of sitting in Austin, and we've like got our, our banners and our shirts, you know, the whole thing. And we're wondering, like, is anybody going to show up? Right? Are we just complete fools? who have like put our reputations on the line for this thing and, 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 and we're sort of looking around like what's going to happen and all of a sudden um, my friends looked at me and they said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And they were just people, thousands and thousands of people coming out. Um, it was the largest protest for Africa in American history. Over 80,000 people came out that night. Um, and, and, you know, for many of us, it was the first time that we'd ever gotten the chance to put our collective values on display, right? These sort of things that we all kind of agree about, like these fundamental truths, like sort of all people are born equal, all people are born free. It was the first time, especially for, for our generation, that we'd ever gotten the chance to sort of say that out loud. And, and you know, it was kind of this moment where we were like text messaging everybody, like, you know, in different cities. Are there thousands of people where you're at? And they're like, thousands of people where we're at, thousands of people where you're at. And oh my gosh, and people had just come out. And the result was that just a few weeks later, the State Department started referring to the conflict in northern Uganda as an emergency. First time in 22 years of war, the State Department had acknowledged that this war was an emergency. Almost no one organizing it was over 25. And it was sort of like, oh. We just changed the State Department, right? If we can do this, what else can we do? And so the next year we decided to do it again, and this year it was even bigger, and we did it in less cities, so there was higher concentration. Again, about 80,000 students came out all across the country. We built displacement camps out of cardboard uh, in every major city, and, and the result of that was that the State Department appointed $20 million to the peace process and a senior-level diplomat, bringing the war as close as it had been to ending in 23 years. Almost no one organizing it was over 26. Um, and right about that time, a buddy of mine started a company called Tom's Shoes. Have you guys heard of Tom's? It's a shoe company where for every pair of shoes they sell, they give one to a kid who needs shoes. And, and so this was sort of, I just show this picture because it makes me look cool. Uh, this is, it was sort of the original idea was like, uh, elevate your soul, right? You're like jumping and you're giving and so soul and soul. You guys get it. Nobody really cared. It was a stupid campaign and, and it never really worked. But Tom's really worked. And, um, and so... Tom's was able to go from selling like 100 shoes, and in a very short order, it just sort of hit. Again, the same constituency of young people that really wanted to help had sort of embraced this idea, and they sold 50,000 shoes. Um, and it was like, 
oh my gosh, now we have to give away 50,000 shoes. How do we do that? And, and so the option came to do our first shoe drop in South Africa. And so I quit my job and hightailed out to South Africa and ended up on this continent. Um, so this is the first day in South Africa. And, and I just show this picture because the only way that I know of to describe this is like cocky little shit. Uh, <laughs> you know, like a stupid white kid who doesn't know anything about anything but we're going to change the world. Hoorah, right? Like, uh, and so going onto this continent, not knowing anything, and for two weeks we gave away shoes. We had 50,000 shoes to give away, so we just gave them away. We gave away shoes, and 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 we gave away shoes. And the thing about shoes is that it's not water, and it's not education, right? It's not like sustainable development. It's not what you want. Um, but shoes provide this stunning moment of connection between two human beings who would otherwise never have been connected. Right? You're sort of sit I mean, this moment, these kids ran up to our van and they're like, you know, hey, hey, do you have any food? Do you have any water? And we're like, ah, oh, no, but what size shoe are you? And they're sort, we're, they're sort of like, <laughs> we've never owned shoes, right? And it's like, right, stupid white people, like yet again, right? This sort of uh, like our ignorance kind of on full display. And but you, you know, you give them these shoes, and 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 now you're a part of each other's lives, right? It's it's brief, it's momentary but there is a moment of connection. And I think connection is maybe the currency that makes our world go round. It is not to be underestimated in a lot of ways. And so um, from there, I just wanted to get lost. I don't know if any of you guys have ever wanted that before. That sort of like uncontrollable desire to just break free and, and get lost. And um, we use this quote by Herman Melville. He says, it is not down on any map. True places never are. So the idea was to find true places, right? True people. Hear sounds I never heard before, smell smells I never smelled before, and just go. And so we wondered. We explored and we explored. That's Hanson. It was kind of random. We met them on the continent. Uh, kept exploring, kept exploring, and ended up in northern Uganda. And, and this is a girl named Rosalind. And you know, it was it was my job for to spend a couple weeks with Rosalind and to sort of film her and tell her story, so that the Western audience could sort of know who she was. And you know, Rosalind was 14. Uh, she had been born with AIDS inside a war. And we spent two weeks together, and as you do with anyone that you spend two weeks together with, right, you get very close. Um, and, and at the end of the two weeks, it's sort of pouring down rain. We're saying goodbye, and I'm so thankful for the rain because, you know, we're all crying, and you don't want the Ugandan men to think you're a sissy. And, uh, and, and she looks me in the eyes, and she says, Sean, our skin is a different color, but our blood is the same. You're my brother. I'm your sister. Uh, you know, and there's an element of... I mean, here we are, right? We're sitting, and, and, I, and I just want to be sort of really frank about this. We're sitting you know, inside Africa's longest running war with a girl who's born with a totally treatable disease, right? And she gets what all of our great visionaries have always gotten, and so few of us have understood, right? This idea that like, we are all the same, right? That we are, in fact, one. And, and she's going to die, right? This 14-year-old girl is like destined to almost certain death. And, and the question for me, you know, I'm a young man, I'm like 26 at this point, it's just sort of like, why? Right, like for what purpose is she going to die? And, and, and there's this moment, I'll, I'll never forget, you guys remember like Bill Gates a handful of years ago decided to save the world, right? And, um, in no way do I want to take away from, from, from the effort, I think it's great. But uh, he had sort of called together all the world's experts on all of our major issues, health, the environment, water, war, all of it. So he's surrounded by all these gray hairs with like charts and graphs and easels, and they're explaining to him all these problems that are so entrenched. And he's sitting there with his hand on his head, and he just says, it's just the distribution problem. Like, we can solve all of this if we just distribute it better. And so the question for me as a young man sort of looking into this girl's eyes was like, why aren't we? Right? Then, like, why don't we? Why haven't we? And that was very much so the question as I sort of continued to wander through the continent, continued to get lost. And uh, if any of you like to dance, I beg you to go to the continent of Africa because you will never dance here the way that they dance there. This was a graduation ceremony in a displacement camp. And these people had done this microeconomic program in this camp, had taken the GDP from zero to thriving. Uh, in, in a matter of two years. And, and um, so these are people who are celebrating their first shot at a job, their first shot at a life for themselves, right? One that they could earn for, on their own merit. 
And, and so this is four in the morning with like dust so thick it clogs your lungs, but you dance anyway. People celebrating their first opportunity, first moment when they can have pride and claim a job as their own. Continued to get lost, continued to get lost, and ended up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So here's, here's like the New York Times version of Congo, which I think is a terrible way to introduce a country, but let me give you guys like vital statistics so you have some context. Congo is, uh, right now, it's the country, it's, it's a country the size of Western Europe. It's the size of the United States, east of Mississippi. So take Mississippi, draw a straight line north, right, go east, that's how big Congo is. It's also home to our world's deadliest war. Currently, you're dealing with over 6.9 million people dead. Um, this is the deadliest war since World War II. Right? You're dealing with about 1,500 people dying every single day and about 1,200 women being raped every month. 70% of the world's rapes are taking place in Congo. Of course, we knew none of this when we walked in. Uh, we had just heard there was a lot of problems and we wanted to stick our noses where they didn't belong and um, kind of explore and understand. And so we went in and started to sticking our noses uh, where they didn't belong. And this is, you know, signs of destruction everywhere. This is a van that had been exploded by a rock called grenade case. Um, you know, abandoned children, literally by the thousands, sort of littering the streets. And on the end of the fifth day, we found a military encampment that was holding escaped child soldiers. And it was beating them for war crimes. So these are five boys who had been abducted and they had been forced to kill, right? Forced to fight, forced to force others to kill. And they had escaped. These are sort of among the most clever ones. And they had escaped and they had run to the National Army for refuge and the National Army was torturing them, treating them essentially as enemies of the state. Um, so we kind of freaked out, you can imagine, right? I was 26, I'd never seen anything like this before. And we just started frantically calling everybody we knew, trying to get them pulled out. You know, you got to pull these kids out. you got to pull these kids out. Oh, my gosh, you got to call these kids. Get these kids out. And, and no one would return our phone calls, and no one would really respond to our requests because who are we? We're like 26-year-olds, and we don't know anybody, and we don't have any influence or power. And, and so because no one would listen, we spent the next eight hours just listening to their stories. Right? You're sort of sitting there with them and staring them in the eyes and hearing their stories. And, and, and you know, storytelling is strange, and storytelling is powerful. Um, we had, had very, very little in common. I grew up in San Diego, went to University in Austin. Um, you know, they were born in the jungle, right? Taken at eight, forced to kill at 10, at 12 they're being tortured. But as we shared each other's stories, it's like, you know, we feel hunger the same way, right? We feel thirst the same way. We sort of laugh at the same jokes, although there's like a 30 second delay because of the translator. Um, Right? We sort of long for our families the same way. They've been away from theirs for four years. I've been away from mine for about four months. As we spoke, it was sort of like the commonalities were overwhelming. And these boys told us that the kids who were too small to carry a gun were being sent to the front lines armed with only a whistle. They're being sent out as human shields, asked to make enough noise with the whistle to scare away the enemy, and then failing that, they were supposed to receive the bullets with their bodies and in falling create a blockade for other soldiers to hide behind. You know, look, I mean, uh, what do you do with information like that, right? How do you, like, even begin to process? Um, one of the boys had a shirt that said, Extinct Forever, which felt very suiting, you know, given what had happened to his childhood. We, um, we exposed the encampment to the UN. The kids got pulled out. The encampment got shut down. It was a pretty intense day, right? Certainly more intense than any day we'd had up to that point. And I went home that night and just bawling through tears and sort of chucking down red wine and punching holes through walls, wrote this blog called Falling Whistles. Sent it out to about 80 friends and family. It was my Google group at the time, actually. Uh, I'd set it up just before I had left. And everyone in that Google group forwarded the blog all the way around the world. I woke up the next day and had thousands and thousands and thousands of messages in my inbox saying, what do we do? How do we help? Why is this happening? What's going on? And it was like, shit, I have no idea. I just got here. I know nothing, right? I, I've never studied this region. I've never studied their role in our world or our role in their world, their influence and sort of the way that we've developed, our influence and the way that they've developed. 
And how is it possible that I had gone through 23 years of education and never been asked to study this vast continent, right? Never been asked to study this place that had really been the center of world history for centuries when looked at through a certain prism. So we decided to figure it out. We made fake press passes and decided to go out. Um, we went out, we went out, we went out, we went out. What we discovered was a vast country, as beautiful as anywhere I've seen. The second largest rainforest in the world. More natural resources in Congo than anywhere else in the world. They estimate that it's $27 trillion worth of natural resources are in Congo today. Put that in context, that's larger than the US and European GDP combined. We found a beautiful people, women who wear these like ornate headscarves with almost as much fabric as their dresses, right? Men who wear these meticulous suits. They might live in a hut and have to walk through a muddy sort of road in order to get to the meeting, but by the time they get to the meeting, they will have polished their shoes and made sure that their shirt is pressed down tightly. A people group who have been battered down for over 120 years, but who carry themselves with enormous pride, right? Tremendous dignity. We also found a people group who had been pillaged by war. Note to self, when hanging out with child soldiers, don't smile. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I was just a little bit nervous. Never done anything like this before. This boy was taken at nine. This is him at 19. You can see that there's not a trace of a child left on him. Um, these boys were both in their teens. We went deep into the base camps of the surrounding military groups. Warlords, rebel leaders asking, why is this happening? What's going on? Who's funding you? Who's behind it? This man to my left, or to my, to my left is a man named Major Alexei. Major Alexei was 21, studying poetry and philosophy at university. In this photo, he's 29. War broke out. He went and fought for the side he thought was most patriotic. Since then, he's done unspeakable things, right? He's raped women and taken children, burned villages, killed thousands. You know, when you sit down and have a cup of coffee with him, he still feels a whole lot like that 21-year-old who was studying poetry and philosophy. Right? Is he a monster? Absolutely. Does he deserve justice? Absolutely. But the deeper we dug, the more we saw humanity and even the most evil of creatures. This boy had been tied up and beaten by the warlord in Kunda. We asked this boy to draw what he had seen. He drew a tree on fire and a gun with blood coming out of it. You can see by this time it was a very different trip from the one that we had intended for it to be. We found war, more war, more war, more war. This man's in Kunda. He's wanted by the International Criminal Court. He's currently arrested in Rwanda. We spent the day together. Found war, so much war. By the end of it, I was just ready to get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> this is me, my first day home with a mimosa to my side. Glad to be back home. And what do you do? I mean, I want to like honestly ask you guys, like, what do you do in a situation like this, right? You sort of like have this enormous amount of new knowledge, this enormous amount of new understanding about what's really happening and what's behind it, and no resources to channel any of it. And so I just sort of went a little bit crazy uh, and just started writing. I like wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And I would go to parties with my friends and I would just scream at everybody I met. Kids are dying. Kids are dying. This is happening right now, right now, right now. This is real. Women are being raped. Children are dying at this moment at an emergency rate right now. Right now, like, eventually you just stop getting invited back, right? Like, who wants to hang out with that kid? Uh, and so, in the midst of my craziness, uh, one of my best friends, a guy named Marcus, street artist in San Diego, he went and he got an old vintage whistle. And he gave it to me, he put it around my neck, and he said, no matter where you go, keep those boys alive in your heart. All of a sudden, we could go to parties and we didn't have to scream at anybody anymore because everywhere we'd go, people would ask, what's the whistle? We got a chance to speak up for the boys in a way that, you know, sort of elevated the conversation rather than destroyed it. We started saying, 
basically the whistle became our symbol of protest as we pursued solutions in a region where they're in short supply. We started saying, make their weapon your voice. Be a whistleblower for peace. We started studying this history of whistleblowers. This was us, our first day in the office, sort of screaming at the world, right? Our first piece of furniture was a bucket. Uh, we studied this history of whistleblowers. People who had said what needed to be said long before it was popular. Long before they had the answers, they said what was right because they knew it to be true and they couldn't allow themselves not to. People who had spoke out in defiance the prevailing systems and in pursuit of what could be. We started selling them out of our back pockets. I was sort of like the Timex guy, like selling whistles, putting them on people's necks and saying, go and speak for peace, go and speak for peace, go and speak for peace. And it worked. People wore them and they went out and everywhere they'd go, they'd have this conversation about what was happening in Congo. Conversation they'd never had before. And it was just explosive. We had $150. We started with five. We raised $150. We knew we were going to have to reach the entire world with what was happening. And so a friend of mine hitchhiked from Austin to New York City. He hitchhiked over the course of four months into, into, into over 40 cities. And he stopped down with small groups of people just like this. And he said, we don't have all the answers. In fact, we have almost none. That's all right. Uh, but we're not going to be quiet about this problem. Join us. Be whistleblowers for peace. He got picked up by an ex-convict in Tennessee. He got picked up by uh, like these death metal kids in Alabama. And when he told them that he didn't like death metal, they dropped him up from, in front of a cop and blew pot in front of his face so that he would smell bad and get picked up. Uh, he got picked up in Philly by a guy who bought him a jacket and a pair of shoes because all he had was a hoodie and a holy pair of toms on. It was about 20 degrees outside. We had three college students who rode their bicycles from Florida to San Diego, stopping in every city and saying the same thing. We don't have all the answers, but we're not going to be quiet while six million people lose their lives. Join us. We had a kid sleep out of an attic for four months to do design work for free. That's why we have a website. We had a kid sell his company in Houston and move out to LA to run finances for free. We've now had 40 interns come from all over North America, sleep in bunk beds and work out of our crappy little garage, demanding more of the world. It worked. People wore them, and they wore them, and they wore them. And everywhere they went, they had new conversations. The Falling Whistles campaign was born. A campaign for peace in Congo. This is our garage where we got deaths out of dumpsters and where we piled in enormous amounts of people. And what we do now is we sell the whistle with the original story that was sort of the moment that made me sort of wake up and the moment that made so many of our readers wake up. And we sell it in stores. We sell it in retail. Stephen Allen, this designer, came to us and he said, well, I love your whistles. Can we sell them in our stores? And we said, can we do that? Is that possible? And he said, yeah. So we went to our friends at Tom's. We learned how to sell in stores. We started selling in stores. This is in Fred Siegel. We started building these in income generating museums. It says, could this little whistle in the world's largest war? And we built the whole thing, floor, wall, ceilings. And what we found with this museum, for example, was Michael Siegel came to us and he said, you know, in the three months that you've been here, You've been in the top five selling brands of our entire year. You helped keep Fred Siegel alive. And so in the three months that we were in Fred Siegel when we first launched, we helped keep one of the most powerful retailers alive. We earned enough money to rehabilitate 267 kids, open up an office in DC, and we educated over 20,000 people about the problem. From nothing, right? The whole thing cost, cost us about $200 to build. Yeah, I'll tell you about it, yeah. Um, and so we build these museums, right, in stores. This one was built in Soho. Um, the cool thing about this is it's literally like eight bolts. You can pull it off the wall and bring it to another store. It's been on rotation from store to store to store. The stores love it because they make money. Uh, they're able to make money living out their conscience, right? They drive press, that's the nation, customers. And here's the most exciting part about this is that what we're doing is we're giving them financial incentive to educate their community and advocate for peace. Because the more educated their community is, the more whistles they sell. And so we made this one in Donna Karen's store. And the cool thing about this is that, you know, we didn't actually build this. We just emailed the files to Donna Karen's people. And because they had financial incentive, they made it themselves. And so these sorts of decisions are happening. The things that are sort of around Congo are happening in closed doors in DC, right? 
the reason why they're able to perpetuate century after century is because none of us know about it. And the media doesn't print it. And so what we're saying is we're going to skip the media. We've now opened up an office in D.C. and they're behind these closed doors getting this information, passing it to us in L.A. We'll beautify it, make it sexy, and then distribute it out to retailers to go directly into the hands of communities. Skipping the entire media and also in some ways skipping the internet and just going right into their communities. We've built these all over the country. We built this one in Portland. Light boxes, illuminating stories that have been held in shadows for centuries. They're very visual, very educational, by right? educating people about the roots of the problem. What we've done in Congo is we've found visionaries, young local visionaries who are already doing the work. We come along behind them, essentially like a venture capital firm in a lot of ways, help them professionalize, help them create world-class systems of accountability, transparency, and then we're giving them the tools they need to stop the cycles of violence inside their region, right? Rehabilitating children now and eventually women. Program's totally holistic, takes them through expression therapy, job skills training, nutrition, basic education, psychosocial support, ultimately reintegration which is actually much harder than it sounds. And on that first day in the encampment, um, we found out that two of the boys had fought for opposing rebel groups. And I asked them, does that make you enemies? And one of them looked over at the other one and he kissed him and he said, we are only boys. How can we be enemies? And it was sort of like ball game. Right, that's the whole deal right there. If we can connect people before they become defenders of the systems that sustain them, hold them accountable to those connections, we live in a very different world in 10 years. Because this is real, right? I mean, this happened. The turn of the century, bicycles became very popular. And then beyond that, the automobile. And so there was a new need for rubber. And what Mark Twain said is the horseless carriage has brought the world closer together. What he's obviously referring to is the way the automobile has changed the way our world operated, right? Cars changed the way our communities operated. But what he's also referring to is that in our pursuit of rubber for the automobile, 10 million people were killed in the Congo. From 1880 to 1900, 20 years. There was a holocaust of almost unprecedented proportions. 10 million people were killed. It was literally half the country. The same thing has happened today. Well, real quick, there, when, uh, when they didn't turn in enough rubber, their hands were cut off. This was sort of their punishment for not bringing in enough of the rubber. We put in place a man who stole Billions and billions of dollars with resources made sure that Western companies had those resources to thrive. This is real and this happened as a result. The same thing is happening today. The resources in Congo are what are used to create many of our electronic products. And it's the illicit trading of these minerals that fund this war. Minerals necessary for processes, coltan, casserite, tungsten, tin. And this technology has brought the world closer together in extraordinary ways. You guys know it more than almost anyone else. My blog never would have been read by thousands of people had we not had that capacity. But the resources necessary for this technology is causing another genocide, another holocaust of mass proportions. So what we did was we took the W from we the people and we took the P from people and turned it into an F. We are following whistles for a freer world. How have unfree people ever become free? Through whistleblowing. Right? The individual protest and the collective rising of a people group. And so I'm here at Google asking for your partnership in solving one of the deadliest problems of our time. It's a hell of a challenge. But I think that most of you are probably entrepreneurs in one way or another. And if you are, then you love problem solving. So do we.
And there are areas that you guys have capacities in that we absolutely don't. So what we're doing right now is we sell the whistle, we use the money to partner up with local visionaries to stop cycles of violence in the region. But we're also creating sustainable distribution that has the potential to be global through retail. The key insight here is that whoever controls, because you're dealing with a problem that's never been talked about in mass, right, by the mass media. So whoever controls distribution of information controls perception. And whoever controls perception controls paradigm. And whoever controls paradigm at a pretty fundamental level controls reality. For those of us who want to change reality, such as living in a 21st century without mass atrocities, living in a 21st century without genocide, what we want to do is create new distribution channels for new kinds of information that psychologically impact people in new ways. And that's why I think retail is so important. Because it's outside of the paradox of choice. Right? You're not at a newsstand, and you're not at a bookstore, and you're not on the internet, but there's so much information coming at you. You're sort of like hanging out with your family or your friends, and you're walking to a beautiful store with beautiful people and beautiful lighting, and they're smiling. And all of a sudden, you're engaged in a subject that you've never heard of before. And you're encountering this museum that's sort of educating you about something that you've never even imagined before. And you're open in a way that you wouldn't be otherwise. So we're going to use retail to build what we hope will be the widest, broadest, most inclusive coalition in history. It will have to be in order to deal with a problem of this size, demanding an end to this war. There are enormous technological solutions available. So one of them is this. This will be my challenge, and, and I want to hear all of your thoughts afterwards. But in 2011, in September, Congo will be having its election. And in Congo today, there are more peacekeepers than anywhere else in the world. 20,000 UN peacekeepers. The UN is spending about $1.2 billion on peacekeeping in Congo, and they're not doing almost anything. In fact, in many ways, they're counterproductive. But the boots are on the ground, the people are there, right? The capacity to respond exists in a way that it doesn't anywhere else in the world. So here's the idea. Let's get Android technology with a live streaming app into, every, into the hands of every single election monitor in Congo. And let's have real time live streaming election monitoring so that every form of coercion, violence, corruption can be immediately reported and we can send that enormous amount of people that we have immediately there and respond. And let's help the Congolese people have the freest and fairest elections in African history. It would be historic. It would be world changing. And only an organization like Google could help pull it off. So that's what we're asking. We're asking for solidarity. In many ways, charity is demeaning. Right? It is, um, has guilt and it has pity, and I hope none of you feel any of that. Hope none of you feel that from us, because we don't have any of that with us. The people who we're working with in Congo are nothing short of extraordinary. They don't deserve our pity and they don't deserve our guilt. I think about how hard it was to start an organization in America where we had everything going for us. They did it in a war zone where they had nothing going for them. They are visionaries. So what we are saying is we're looking into their eyes and we're saying we are with you. Right? Until the boots are off your throat, we are with you. Solidarity. Eve is here as well. I'd love for you guys to meet Eve afterwards. Eve is from the Congo, uh, 10 years old. He left because there was war. And he has an extraordinary story that I'd love for him to share with you guys. But what we are about in the very end, in the final measure, is free men and free women using the thing that is most fundamental to our freedom, our speech, in order to fight for others. There's a short film that I'd love to show you guys, if you guys have a couple more minutes, and then we can talk a little bit and do some question and answer. Would that be cool? Great. Let me get it. Welcome to our program. My friend Sean had just gotten back from the Congo. In an empty warehouse, listening to reports from the ground. 
we moved into understanding the deadliest war in our world and what we could do to help. I'm calling out from my native country, country I call home, from a continent that we all call home. You and me, me and we, we live free, so hear me. An emergency exists right now. The Great War of Africa, fought on the hills and plains of the eastern Congo, has killed more people than any other conflict since the Second World War, and is still killing them. Mortality survey found as many as 5.4 million people have died from war-related causes in the Congo. Armies of business, they went into Congo not to track down killers, but to seize the country's unbelievably immense mineral wealth, to grab it and to sell it out to New York, to London, to Paris, to the developing world. People have looked at Congo for over 100 years and they've seen a great big pile of riches with some black people inconveniently sitting on top of it. It's not a distant tribal war that has nothing to do with you. It's a war whose trail of blood leads absolutely directly to our world and indeed to your own apartment. Militia groups are targeting civilians and there's widespread killing, rape and are no longer fighting each other so much but instead targeting the other side's women. For Congolese children, the tragedy is a massacre in their villages by machetes or recruited as child soldiers. Hundreds of thousands of children are victims and many have become murderers. Our child soldiers then told us that the kids, too small to carry a gun, were being sent to the front lines armed with only a whistle. An emergency exists right now. 5.4 million people have died from war-related causes in the Congo since 1998. We didn't have much, but out of the void, an idea. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Their weapon could be our voice. We did what anyone would. We sold the whistle to rehabilitate the most vulnerable. And for all the children in Congo, I say we should come together and go back to school and rebuild our country. We found Congolese visionaries and partnered with them to rehabilitate hundreds of children and lead the future generation. This is only the beginning. What we need is peace. But as the broadcast continued, we knew that there was more for all of us to do. And it's a real disgrace to us because last time there was this scale of mass slaughter in the Congo is when the Belgians colonized it and killed 10 million people. So the situation that occurred under King Leopold 100 years ago is basically what you've got in Congo today. There were mass campaigns across the developed world led by people like Joseph Conrad, Arthur Conan Doyle. So there were questions asked in the Senate. There were huge mass meetings in London. The same thing has happened in our lifetimes and we've done virtually nothing. We needed a symbol that would stand for peace and drive towards the end of the largest war in the world. And the whistle, it sounded like this. If we believe, as they believe, that all of us free, then dear whistle blow for peace. We didn't have all the answers, but dreamed that falling whistles would turn towards peace in Congo with four forward steps first. We must educate. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights. Our past is filled with a history of whistleblowers standing up against impossible odds. We will learn from these giants published solutions from better minds than our own. We call it the free world leader towards ending the violence in the Congo. To educate is one thing. But we knew we'd have to get the message out for a free Congo. We have to disseminate the idea that peace is possible. So we build museums in the heart of retail stores, telling a story of Congo and the path to peace. The message is out there, and brave men and women are responding individually. However, 
We need a place to congregate together around ideas that will lead to peace. Like the speakeasies of old, gathering in defiance of an unjust law. Whistler societies will grow together people to participate in solutions and end the violence of an unjust war. And finally, free men and free women will use that which is most fundamental to our freedom, our speech, to speak truth to power and advocate. We will go on to petition lawmakers for conflict-free electronics and stamp our protest towards a full resolution, not stopping until that final day, the day we see peace in common. We are all immigrants. We are all refugees. My refugees of the free. Be a whistleblower for peace. Both of our countries now face the same problem of a swiftly changing world. The same question of how to bring our abundance and our technological progress to the fulfillment of all men and the liberation of all mankind. So I come here to South Africa learning to live together in mutual respect for the rights and the well-being of all of our people. Rehabilitate, educate, disseminate, congregate, advocate. If this wheel is rolling, then we are on the move. And peace is the new frontier. We believe. Do you? Thank you, truly, for giving us the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, appreciate it.